gentlemen, if you will give the, give the seats to the ladies. The epistle for the 10th Sunday after Pentecost is taken from St. Paul's letter to the Corinthians chapter 12. Brethren, you know that when you were heathens, you went to dumb idols according as you were led. Wherefore, I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God says anathema to Jesus, and no man can say the Lord Jesus but by the Holy Ghost. Now there are diversities of graces, but the same Spirit. And there are diversities of ministries with the same Lord. And there are diversities of operations, but the same God who worketh all in all. And the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man unto profit. To one indeed by the Spirit is given the word of wisdom, and to another the word of knowledge, according to the same Spirit. To another faith in the same Spirit. To another the grace of healing in one Spirit to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another the discerning of spirits, to another diverse kinds of languages, to another interpretation of speeches. But all these things, one and the same Spirit, worketh, dividing to every one according as he will. The Holy Gospel. Taken from St. Luke, chapter 18. At that time Jesus spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves as just and despised others. Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee standing prayed thus with himself, O God, I give thee thanks that I am not as the rest of men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, as also is this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican, standing afar off, would not so much as lift up his eyes towards heaven, but he struck his breast, saying, O God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I say to you, this man went down into his house justified rather than the other, because every one that exalts himself shall be humbled, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Thus are the words of the sacred scripture. <clears throat> In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. <clears throat> Today we will see one of the uh, missions, one of the 29 missions founded by the Holy Franciscans, who established missions almost a day's walk away from each other, all the way up the coast of California, to bring all these souls to the Catholic faith, to save them from hell, and to establish missions. And the missions were a place not only for mass, but it, it absorbed their whole life, their whole farming, their whole tilling the ground, their harvesting, their rising, everything centered around the bell. As in Europe, the first cities were always established around the monasteries because the center of life, as people understood, was not the banks, was not the stadiums, it was the altar. Always around Jesus Christ, the true God who walks among us, who walks with us, who stays with us, sanctifying us through His holy sacraments, through His holy doctrine, and through the holy priesthood, whom he commanded the priests to teach this doctrine, not their own, not their own doctrine, not a watered-down version of the true doctrine, not a evolving doctrine for the, as for the modernists, but the doctrine that's always beautiful, always the same. And that's why St. Pius X held up the catechism as the victory over the modernists. The catechism St. Thomas Aquinas' theology and philosophy and um, the true sacraments. And he forewarned there will come a time when they will keep the name of the sacraments, keep the name of certain things, but gut it out and give it a new meaning. And so that's happened with, for example, baptism. Baptism, which is always the great sacrament to wash away original sin, 
the modernists have made it a sacrament of initiation into the community, whatever that means. And it's man-centered instead of God-centered. And same with the holy sacrifice of the Mass. The Holy Mass has been the new Mass, of course, as Archbishop Lefebvre called it, the, the Mass Batard, the Bastard Mass, the illegitimate Mass that makes the priest first lose the faith. And the faithful also lose their faith by attending the new Mass because you, it erodes the faith. Because everything is built in there and it's a perfect modernist ceremony. you got to understand this point. It is not out, outrightly heretical and it can be valid. But this is the triumph of modernism is to blend poison into the truth and blend it together. <coughs> So there's a lot of Catholic elements in the New Mass, you can't argue that. <clears throat> but there's also enormous amount of Protestant heresies within the New Mass, Protestant errors, and also modernism. So Protestantism, modernism, Catholicism blended into one ritual. And that's why Archbishop of says, Lefebvre always said, you cannot go to the New Mass. You cannot go. It does not fulfill your Sunday obligation. And then he also said, those priests who compromise with Vatican II and the new Mass, you cannot go to their Mass either. That's why the Society of Pius X always used to say, used to say, always used to say, and now they're not saying this. The prior, one of the priors in Pulse Falls said to people who ask him, can I go to St. Peter's Mass? It's more convenient of time. Yeah, no problem. No problem. But there is a problem, because priests who have compromised with Vatican II in the new Mass, in other words, have betrayed our Lord, dissolved the faith, by attending and going to their Masses, you, you attend their beliefs. You support their errors. And that's why during the great communist persecution in Hungary, the Catholic people would not go to the Mass of the Catholic priests who signed allegiance to the communist government because they promised they would say nothing against communism, nothing against this godless system that destroys all religion out of society. The only one that did not take it was Cardinal, Men Cardinal uh, Menzenti. He was in prison for 14 years and tortured in the concentration camps. And why did the people not go? It was Latin Mass. It was valid. Traditional vestments, traditional ceremonies, everything was pretty much the same. Why did the Catholic people say, no, I can't go to that Mass? Why? Because the priests compromised the faith. And the priests are supposed to be shepherds to teach the true doctrine and give you the true grace through the sacraments. But they cannot play with the doctrine. And that's why Archbishop Lefebvre said, with this situation where you have traditional priests but who accept Vatican II and the new Mass or compromise it with it in any way, you cannot go because you put the faith in danger. You put the faith in danger. And the faith is the fundamental ground on which to stand on to save our soul. St. Mary Magdalene could lose her purity, but she never lost the faith. The good thief was a thief. But he obtained the grace of the faith by repentance and humility. But if we lose the faith, we lose it all. And that's why it's so important now in this, these days of apostasy, these days where the devil rules this world and is taking so many souls to hell. So many souls to hell. And most souls are going, having a good time too. And yet, in this time, God has put us. And we have to fight to defend the true faith in an age where it's being most subtly attacked at every, every angle. Consider this point also. The value of your soul. The value of your soul. Firstly, learn from the enemy. Learn from the enemy. How does the devil value your soul? He doesn't sleep to get it. He never rests day or night. 
He spends every bit of energy he has to damn your soul, to tempt you to sin, to get you to fall into mortal sin, to be careless with prayer, careless with uh, spiritual reading, careless with raising your heart and mind to God, to keep that close friendship with God. He wants to distract you with everything to make you just a distracted, like water. Water, that's why the, the ocean or the sea is compared to this world. In the morning it's calm, in the midday it's choppy, at night it's wild. Because this world is so flippant. And if we love this world, we'll be flippant like this world. But we want to be anchored in the love of God. So the devil knows the value of your soul. He is the hunter par excellence. He has you always in his scope like the buck hunter. He always has you in his scope. He never loses, loses sight of you, especially you who have the faith. And those who live in the state of grace, he especially wages war. He hates those who live in the friendship of God because he's envious that you can obtain the happiness he lost. So learn from the enemy. The devil values your soul. He wants you in hell and he will work He's got a lot of years of experience with the human nature. And he doesn't make a person fall usually suddenly into mortal sin. Suddenly to lose their faith. It's little by little. After graduation, they're not around the altar anymore. They're not around their family anymore. Well, the world becomes more attractive. Oh, Sunday Mass, well, what's wrong with missing one Sunday Mass? Daily Rosary, oh, that's, Mom used to do that, Dad. And then slowly they slip away. And slowly they don't even realize, like the, the riptide that just pulls you away from shore, you don't even realize it. And you've got to be on guard, because a lot of our boys that graduate out of our, our society schools and colleges and they're drawn to the world. And many of them, many are on the road to hell already. Many are on the road to hell. And so, learn from the enemy the value of your soul. And then, of course, you know the value of your soul by all that God has done for it. God the Father, who sent His only begotten Son to save us from hell. God the Father couldn't have given us a greater gift, a greater... Uh, he couldn't just give anything greater than His own Divine Son and the Holy Ghost. The Son loves you because He really was the person of God who took on flesh. And as He said, I came not to call the just, but sinners. And sinners, we are, we are the sinners. Pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. We are the poor sinners that humble our, we must humble our soul before God. And Christ, who is God Himself, when the Pharisees surrounded Him to stone Him, He asked them the question, Bob George, wake up. He asked them the question, Why do you stone me? What works have I done? For what reason do you stone me? And the Jews said, it's not because of your miracles and your wonders and your works, but because of what you say. And what did Christ say? Because you being a man, make yourself God. That's why we stone you. And Christ said, if you don't believe my words, believe my works. Because only God can make the blind see, the leprosy cleanse, the, the, the possessed to be freed from the devil. Only God can work these miracles. And the biggest miracle that the Pharisees were so enraged about was ra raising Lazarus from the dead. Because they all respected Lazarus. He was a wealthy man in Bethany. And his, sis his sisters were uh, St. Mary Magdalene and St. Martha. And so when Christ, after four <coughs> days stinking in the grave in the hot summer, raised this man from the dead, there was just no objection. And so, Christ loves each soul, and He really thought of you during the Passion. Don't be one of those who say, oh, well, Christ, yeah, He loves everybody, but He doesn't love my soul. 
or he, yeah, he's, he's God, he loves everybody generally. No, he, St. Teresa heard from the mouth of our Lord, my daughter, he said, I would go through the whole passion just for your soul. But because each drop of his blood is infinite price, he doesn't have to. But that's the love Christ has for each soul. And I can toot on forever about the love of God, the love of God, and it's just all hot air. Because I haven't died for you. But look at what he did. The love of God is such, he really was butchered for your soul. He really was tormented and died the most excruciating pain. And all that time he was going through all the names of those who will love him in heaven and on this earth. He thought of St. Benedict, he thought of St. Martin of Tours, St. Teresa, Archbishop Lefebvre. He thought of all those who will really love him. And, for, and he was saying it was worth to suffer the passion to save your soul. And that's the love of Christ has, a sudden for each soul. And that's not, it doesn't stop on the cross. For the Protestants, they say, well, Christ died once and it's over and all. No. No, you're not saved. You're not saved till you get to heaven. And it's nonsense to say, oh, I'm saved. When the Holy Ghost Himself says, you've got to save your soul through fear and trembling. You've got to fight temptation. You've got to fight to keep the faith. You've got to grow in sanctity. You've got to grow in the love of God. Like a plant, you just don't plant it, water it once, and it's over. And that's where Protestant heresy has so many dis deluded it going to hell. But Christ continues His sacrifice in the Mass. That's why in Christendom, the huge basilicas and cathedrals and monasteries and convents everywhere, chapels everywhere, crucifixes on every street corner, because because Christ reenacts His sacrifice in the Mass. It's the greatest miracle possible of love. And then He gives Himself to you to, to eat. My flesh is, is for the life of the world, He said. Unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you won't have life in you. So the Holy Eucharist is the divine fire that you eat. It's really the fire of God. And whatever touches fire, when you join two uh, iron rods, one's white hot and the other's cold, when the other one touches it, eventually it becomes itself white hot. And that's exactly what happens when you touch Almighty God in Holy Communion. And He wants to inflame your soul with the fire of love of God, fire of zeal for the salvation of souls. But how many of us put a block and are colder just as before as after. And then He gives you to drink in Holy Communion His precious blood. That blood is which is a shield against the powers of hell. And strengthens you and heals the wounds of sin. That's why Holy Communion is so important. And frequent spiritual communions when you cannot go to communion. Like Dominic for his uh, gluten-free thing. He can only go once a, once a week. So. And that's not all, the, the, the Son. Then He left all the sacraments. He knew He would fall and get bruised up and even fall and get shot by mortal sin. Mm -hmm. That's why He left confession. He knows we're in battle. And confession heals you, forgives you, breaks the chains of the devil, and lets you free like Lazarus right out of the tomb. The confessional is like a tomb. And those who walk out are, have a whole new life. And then all the, all the other sacraments, confirmation that makes you soldiers to fight, and preparing for death by extreme unction, and so forth, and marriage to show the, the holiness of the union of man and woman, making their vows to God to take all the children God sends. So, and all of God's plan is it's so beautiful. And then the <coughs> Son dying on the cross, he left his priesthood, the Catholic priesthood. And that's one of the devil's biggest targets, is to destroy the Catholic priesthood. Because you destroy the priest, you destroy the sacrifice of the Mass, the sacraments, the true doctrine, the teaching. You destroy the priest, as St. John Vianney said, you leave a priest 25 years, a parish without a priest for 25 years, they'll be worshipping animals. 
And the greatest punishment God allows on a, a given society is bad priests, weak priests, compromising priests, modernist priests, liberal priests. That is one of the greatest punishments God can permit. And that's why the enemies of Christ, they know they had to infiltrate the seminaries. Bella Dodd told Bishop Sheen back in the 30s, she was a communist who converted, she told him, we sent over 10,000 infiltrators into the seminaries. And all these infiltrators, communists, that they said, since the priests won't become communists, the communists will become priests. And they infiltrated the seminaries in the 30s and 40s and 50s. And whoa, what do you got by 1960s? Bishops, priests who are all <coughs> communists and, and penetrated with poison and bad theology and modernist philosophy. So these were the bishops of Vatican II that destroyed the church, or tried to, from within. And that's why Archbishop Lefebvre held the line. And that's why now, with the Society of Pius X, wanting so badly to make this agreement with Rome and punishing all the priests who are saying, don't go in this direction. It's the same, same compromise that's happening. So we got to hold strong without compromise to the true doctrine, to the true faith, to the true mass, with no compromise with the diabolical Vatican II. And so our Lord shows you his, the, the, the great love of the Sacred Heart by dying for you, leaving you his sacraments, and guess what? One of the greatest gifts he could give us that really none of us can ever give, but he could, was his own mother. His mother is our mother. And Our Lady loves her son. We just can't comprehend that, that love of her son. But she loves you just as much, because he bought you with his blood. And so she is your mother and she looks after you. And she loves you tenderly like a mother. And that's why you must be so close to her. And you show your consecration to her like a shield on your chest and back by wearing the scapular. <clears throat> and she promises those who die wearing the scapular will not suffer eternal fire. What a gift. What a tremendous thing. And then the five first Saturdays. How many of you have done those? Don't raise your hand, but... How many of you have done the five first Saturdays? When I ask boys in school or elsewhere, oh, I've never done them. Oh, I never, I started them, but I never finished. Or the nine first Fridays of the Sacred Heart. How careless we are with these tremendous gifts from God. And yet, Catholics just, many of them traditional Catholics, don't really even care. But if you are offered, you know, go to this, go to this baseball game and you can win five billion dollar ticket and how many will go out of their way to try to win the lottery or five billion dollars they'll do anything mm. and what's five billion dollars to eternal life nothing it's just hot air so Christ gave us his own mother and she like a mother has warned us of our times that we're in and she gave us the weapons to fight with the daily rosary and the scapular and of course, the true Mass and the true doctrine, that goes without saying. And the Holy Ghost, how is the Holy Ghost, the third person of the Trinity, how does He value your soul? Well, He is sent by the Father and the Son into your soul by sanctifying grace, so that your soul becomes completely transformed. Your whole body also is affected by grace. Everything about you is affected by grace. And the Holy Ghost in the soul strengthens you in this combat. And all the gifts of the Holy Ghost, I won't go through all of them now, but the wisdom to seek the things of God, counsel to avoid the deceits of the devil, piety so that you learn to love God really as your Father, and not just, oh, I'm going to get punished so I don't want to sin. God wants our love, He wants our mind, He wants our heart. And he'll always be knocking at your door. And should any soul stray from him and go the way of the world, he will always be knocking. And we hear this all the time. 
And how many boys I know, <coughs> how many boys I know in my short life as a priest, well, so far, how many boys I know who've played with God's mercy and God allowed them a close call accident. I mean, the doctors just say, I, we don't know how you survive. But the boys all know. They tell me, Father, I was, I was running from God. I wasn't going to confession. I wasn't praying. I was living a wild life. And this was a grace for me. How many times we hear that. And that's the mother of God's intercession. She's the one that stands between the son and the father and the soul saying, Please spare him one more chance. And some boys I know were foolish. They took many chances. Chances. They got to be careful. And then is that is that all God has given us? The love of the Father, Son, Holy Ghost, His Mother. He's also given you a bodyguard. Your guardian angel. And your guardian angel stands taller than any of these trees, and with power and majesty and a sword of fire. That's the real angels. The scripture doesn't describe the angels as Gerber babies <laughs> floating around uh, with little wings. Uh, they're angels that are powerful and mighty to behold. And millions and millions of them. So you got a guardian, a guardian angel who protects you. And befriend your guardian angel. And St. John Bosco told his boys, if you want to know the name of your guardian angel, the priests have two of them, so I know both of their names. If you want to know the name of your guardian angel, receive communion three times in a row, three consecutive days, asking each time, O oh Lord and Blessed Mother, help me to know. Tell me the name of my guardian angel. And on the third communion, you will know it. That's what St. John Bosco used to say. And so... What more can God give us? What more can He show us to love us? And then look at this beautiful California weather. Look at the beautiful Eastern weather. Look at the beautiful weather. And this is after the world has already been punished for, for sin by the flood. So we breathe God's beautiful air. We walk on His beautiful gravity and earth. You enjoy His ocean. You enjoy His waters, His beaches, His mountains, His food. His cornflakes are his corn. His fruits are his fruits. And look at the variety of the fruits. It's impressive. Look at the egg. Something so simple, but it's miraculous almost. Something so brittle, it's so easy to break, but you put it between your hands and try to crush it. You can't. A real egg, not the, not the false manufactured eggs. But a real egg. It's incredible. Just the, any man who has any sense should, should, should come to say how beautiful God is. And yet, how we use, misuse God's gifts. Our bodies to offend Him. Our minds to ignore Him. Our hearts to love hot air and mud puddles. And that's the complaint of the Sacred Heart in Scripture. O oh, sons of men, why do you go thirsting in mud puddles to drink? When I give you the, the fountain of life, the sweet wine of my grace, why do you chase after vanities when I have heaven for you? So let us ask, like St. Augustine says, and then the man of the gospel, humble ourselves before God and say like St. Augustine, Lord, I don't love you much, but m draw me to you so I do love you. Draw me, attract me to you. And I close with uh, one story you may have heard already. It was given to us by Father John of the Cross in the seminar in the monastery. Father John of the Cross, when he was in La Barue before they compromised with Rome, they had a, a, a priest, excuse me, they had a, a woman come. Dom Gerard had a woman come who survived the concentration camps in Russia. And she gave a story to the monks about an old, she was an old lady by now, but she knew in the concentration camp an old priest. And this priest had been a medical doctor, and he became a priest. And everyone in the concentration camp was, was very impressed with this priest. 
Firstly, he was always very joyful, always smiling. And then uh, he was always attending to the dying and encouraging those who were despairing. And he was uh, hearing confessions and trying to say Mass when the guards weren't looking. He'd say Mass with a little bit of bread and a little bit of wine. He'd consecrate on his chest the words of consecration and perform his, the altar was his chest. <laughs> and uh, this priest, she told them, one guy who was just despairing and almost on the verge of suicide, he said to the priest, Father, why are you always smiling? This place is hell. The snow is all yellow. There's nothing to eat. They're starving us. We're just treated like animals. People die every day. There's brown stuff all over and it stinks. This is the, what they lived in. And the priest said, my son, my son, raise your eyes, he said. He said, I'm a doctor, I know. It takes 43 muscles of the face to frown. And it's only 17 muscles of the face to smile. So see, it's easier to smile. It's less effort. Secondly, he said, look what, look what God has given us. He's given you the sacraments. He's given you His own divine Son. He's given you the Holy Ghost, the state of grace, to, the whole trinity to live in your soul. And He has heaven waiting for you. What reason is there to be sad, even in the midst of all this? And that man died with a good confession, and he died well. And that priest saved many souls, and he himself died. And as uh, Walter used to say, Walter Hugo, he knew uh, old priests in Louvain who were in the concentration camps in Ukraine. And they, they, were, they were trained off, and they gave the worst jobs to the priests. One priest, he said, couldn't eat barbecued food, because his job was to throw the bodies into the fire mm. until they're all charred, and it's just, he just couldn't eat barbecued food anymore. So, so no matter how rough it gets on this earth, and we're going into some rough times, God is going to unleash His great chastisement as foretold by all the saints. Even Pius XII said, God is going to punish the earth so incredibly that he said the dead will, the living will envy the dead. And he said, such a punishment has not, will not have been seen ever in the history of the human race. And we're on the verge of that because man just keeps scoffing at God, spitting in his face, trampling on Jesus Christ, the King, and his blessed mother. And with all these pervert rites and rainbow flag processions <coughs> in Toronto, they're just Catholic priests were marching in these horrible parades. And God, God, that is one sin that calls to heaven for vengeance. Four sins that are always on the headline news now. Willful murder, abortion, and euthanasia calls down fire from heaven. Oppression of the poor, all the uh, oppression of the poor, well, that's, that's a huge explanation, but uh, uh, robbing workers of their just wage, that also calls to heaven for vengeance, and sodomy. These four sins will bring fire on this earth, and it's foretold, it's going to come. So always be ready, but no matter how hard things get, remember the love of God. That's why the Catholics always have crucifixes in all our houses, homes, it should be in our White House, it should be on the top of the White House, it should be on our Constitution papers, it should be on our flag, the crucifix. Because <clears throat> we always love to be reminded of how much God really loves you. Greater love than this no man has, than to lay down his life. <coughs> it will take place in a moment on this altar for his friends. O Mary, conceive without sin. O Mary, conceive without sin. O Mary, conceive without sin. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost.